put people in and the laws in the country don't even help because there aren't really any laws uh, that are very firm to protect the likes of us. So it's survival of the fetus, really. People have to sleep. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult situation. Um, uh, I come from a country called Lesotho. It's in Southern Africa. It's a small country that is in landlocked by South Africa. Uh, we are neighbors with Katleho from Botswana, so Dumela <laughs> Katleho. I just said hello in a language that Katleho and I will understand. Sorry about that, but it always feels good when one can meet somebody who can they can relate to. Anyway, back to the content. Uh, I did a bit of research, and I'm very happy to say that uh, I've learned a lot in this period that I've been granted to be part of this. Dis discussion because I've learned that in my country, small as it is, yes, like the countries you've mentioned, it has, uh, it was a British colony. So we have a very predominant Christian community that is, uh, that are sort of the moral gatekeepers. And these moral gatekeepers obviously will always try to intervene and try to control uh, what happens in terms of what they feel is deemed correct and all of that. But I'm very happy to say that I've learned that at least uh, the GLBTQ uh, plus community has now full rights in terms of uh, there's recognition in parliament. We even have a, a parliamentarian to represent the group, which is a good thing for such a small country. Uh, so I was very happy to learn that and I wouldn't have learned that had I not been granted this opportunity here. Uh, also uh, there is, we currently have the Miss Gay so people really live freely and independently without fear of being exercised. Uh, I'll move on quickly to introduce um, to introduce our, our first our first uh, panelist. Um, who uh, our first panelist is Timothy R. Ozai. Um, I'm sorry. I just I'm sorry about if I pronounce that wrong. Um, uh, Timothy has a, a, an associate director for office. Uh, sorry, and can I hold my paper close in my eyesight is a bit bad and it's dark now. Uh, Timothy Bozzi uh, has associate director for the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in Kenyon College, Ohio, USA, where they specialize in um, fostering LGBT Q plus inclusion and equity on campus. Timothy also serves as the executive director of the ACE and Arrow Alliance of Central Ohio, the state first organization serving a sexual and aromatic air community, a member of the advisory board for the TGNC 360 initiative of the Out Georgia Business Alliance, the state first uh, transgender focused economic empowerment initiative and facilitator of the NCCA uh, Division 3 LG, LGBTQ One Team Program. The, one, the organization is First Nationwide LGBT Plus Inclusion Program. Uh, Tim, uh, I'm happy to welcome you. Uh, I'll, I'll give uh, you this platform to take over. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for, for such a thorough introduction and, and just uh, no worries about the name. It's actually something I'm working on changing very soon anyway. And so um, I don't want you to worry about that at all. Um, so I'm going to get us started with um, sort of the content in terms of um, sort of panelists facing materials. And so, you know, I, I wanted to sort of share just sort of thinking of everyone's expertise um share just with my background being political science and international relations um a bit of sort of the history of like why this topic is important while also um exploring some ways in which um this is sort of manifest uh, manifested in in what we now call north america um if we can do next slide so you know why is this conversation important um you know, as we've already heard um, just about 10 minutes into this event, you know, the legacies of colonialism are certainly still with us. And they're still actively in so many ways, both, you know, implicitly and explicitly impacting the lives of LGBTQIA plus people across the world. And so, you know, when we're talking about, you know, sort of removing these laws that criminalize queer and trans identities, 
you know, in many, many, many instances and nearly uh, most instances, um, we can often trace these back to colonial powers, to European colonial powers. And so, you know, when we're thinking of like this sort of contemporary map of the world and, and where contemporary nation states are, um, you know, you can see nearly every country has been colonized, um, controlled and or influenced in some way, shape or form by European powers. Um, there are very few exceptions to that on this map. Um, if you are not able to see color, um, I just want to acknowledge that you might, that we might have folks that aren't able to see color. Uh, there's about five countries. Um, and if you want to, you want to hover them with that mouse, um, that is, that is a okay. Uh, but yeah, there's about five countries on this map um, that have not been under some type of influence from European colonial powers. And so, you know, the impact of particularly white settler um, colonialism from European powers is very real and it's still very present, right? Um, so we can go to the next slide. There we go. Um, so, you know, what does this topic of, of colonization have to do with LGBTQ plus, QI plus identities? Um, a lot. <laughs> um, and you really, for finding sort of contemporary analyses about the impact of colonialism on the social, the political rights, um, the cultural rights, equity, and ultimately just well-being and safety of LGBTQI plus people, um, you know, that's really fairly easy to find. Um, and I've pulled just a few headlines that have happened in the not so recent past. Most of these are from the past year or so. Um, and you can just kind of see that there are so many different ways in which this topic of the, the legacies of white settler colonialism has impacted um, so many places around the world. And particularly, we sort of see this very notorious legacy with the British Empire, but you know there are obviously so many other impacts from other white settler colonial powers as well. But you know these conversations um, aren't always confined to academic spaces; and they're ongoing. And I think that is one thing that we can see. Um, actually, the, all of these headlines were actually pulled from non-academic sources. So these are these are sort of popular media pieces that are exploring this topic really in depth. Um, and you know, working to shed light on sort of the legacies of this white supremacist um, settler colonialism and the impact that it's left us with today and the challenges that it presents for LGBTQIA plus activists um, around the world. Next slide. And you know, I wanted to give kind of an example, um, just thinking of the various geography, physical geographies um, that that we all as panelists um, sort of represent in one way or another. Um, and you know, certainly in, in what is now known as North America, um, where I am physically located, um, you know, we have sort of a, a very rich history of queer and trans people being here before white settler colonists from the European continent arrived. And Turtle Island, um, which is, um, known today as North America was a term that many, but not certainly not all indigenous nations and societies across the North American continent used to describe this particular mass of land. It's very much like sort of present in many indigenous, um, indigenous uh, origin stories. Um, but prior to the colonization of, of Turtle Island by European powers, so for instance, like Spain, France, England, and the Netherlands sort of most notably, um, many indigenous nations and societies across this continent valued and actually honored queer and trans people that were in their communities. And in many indigenous, um, sovereign indigenous traditions, particularly trans and queer people were often seen as special, divine, holy, and, and sort of spiritual bodies um, in their community. And, you know, that is something that very much white settler colonialism tries to erase, right? Um, and so, you know, fast forward to the 1990s, um, so about 30 years ago, um, a, a group of queer and trans indigenous folks um, end up coining um, this sort of collective term, this collective term of two-spirit. Um, and two-spirit, um, I have a, one sample of a definition right here from an indigenous source, um, but two-spirit refers to a person 
who identifies as having both a masculine and feminine spirit and is used by some indigenous people to describe their sexual, gender, and or spiritual identity. As an umbrella term, it may encompass same-sex attraction and a wide variety of gender variants, including people who might be described in Western culture as LGBTQ+. Um, so, you know, this term gets coined in the early 1990s as a way to recognize the variety of, of queer and trans identities and the, the sovereign and indigenous specific language um, that was present in a lot of these cultures. Um, and, you know, as a way to sort of have also a collective term and sort of the purpose there, recognizing that in some indigenous cultures, this history has been lost. This history has been destroyed by white settler colonialism. And so two-spirit is certainly not a term that every in queer or trans indigenous person uses, but it does um, sort of capture a variety of other identities that might be specific to other sovereign, um, sovereign nations and cultures um, across this continent. Next slide. Oh, I think we went to the, the backwards way. We'll drive, we'll drive forward. Um, yeah. So, you know, when we're talking about two-spirit populations on Turtle Island, um, during colonization, the reality really shifted for these populations. So previously being seen as divine, holy, spiritual, um, and sort of uplifted in, in their communities. And what we see as with many other, um, many other places across the world, is these white settler colonists import the laws from their home countries. Um, so in many places across the North American continent, that's particularly British law. Um, but you know, even before we're talking about British colonialism, we're talking about just sort of the Spanish um, arriving and, and, and really enacting so much violence on indigenous communities. Um, you know, some of the earliest documented massacres of indigenous folks on this continent um, by the Spanish included gender diverse populations. And you know, this is stuff that is documented. It was documented um, by the Spanish. Um, and you know, we know that this existed. We know that these people were persecuted um, under this sort of colonial conquest um, in the name of white supremacy. And you know, similarly, you know, laws criminalizing queer relationships and queer and trans um, gender expressions as sort of we understand them today were outlawed when these laws were implemented in the colonies. Um, and so, you know, what ends up happening is as sovereign indigenous nation states and societies across Turtle Island are, are being actively colonized, their people, their cultures, their histories, their social rights, their political rights, um, all of these things are being intentionally destroyed, intentionally destroyed. And within that, within that population are LGBTQIA plus folks or what we might call today as two-spirit folks uh, in these communities um, were often then misrepresented. We're often misrepresented and sort of showcased as an example of the lack of quote unquote civilization in indigenous nations and societies. Uh, and this is something, like I said, that we can see sort of as early on as, as the first um, sort of Spanish interactions with indigenous nations on this continent. Um, but I did want to also honor that we do have um, photographs of folks who um, identified with indigenous specific terms um, that now sort of fall under this umbrella term of two-spirit. And I've provided a couple of archival photos of some of those folks below. Um, and we are very fortunate to have those because, again, because of the ways in which white settler colonialism operates, it purposely also seeks to, um, sorry, I wanted to make sure I'd say it on time. I talk, I can talk a lot about this, uh, but, um, you know, I wanted to make sure that we also, like, recognize that we do have this history. We do have these even images um, of folks, um, and most of these are from the 1800s, um, 1850s to 1880s. Um, in, in these particular photos. Um, and that despite sort of the presence and the, the, the ongoing impact of this colonialism, we still do have these specific pieces of history with us. They were not able to erase all of them. Um, and so if we can go to the next slide. And so, you know, that is just a very quick glimpse into how this topic has sort of manifested on Turtle Island, or as we now call it, the North American continent. But, you know, really when we're talking about the creation and implementation of anti-LGBTQIA plus laws in countries, um, particularly, uh, you know, 
in other areas of the world, we can see the ways in which these things impact folks. So when we're talking about like Central Africa, for instance, we're seeing you know health disparities um, that might be faced by LGBTQIA plus people um, in other in other countries. So whether we're looking at the ways in which these laws are imported to places in Central Africa and how that contributes to like contemporary political discourse today, or whether we're thinking about the health disparities that are facing um, black and brown LGBTQIA plus folks um, in sort of post-colonial contexts, there are basically so many different examples of how we can look at the impact of colonization on queer and trans rights, equity, and like I said, ultimately well-being. And, you know, I definitely want to go ahead and hand this over to to my to our next um, to our moderator to pass on to the next co-presenter. But I'd also certainly invite folks to learn about the ways in which colonism, um, colonialism has impacted the lives, the social standings, and well-being of other folks, including, for instance, like Hijra communities uh, across the Indian subcontinent as well. And this is just another clear example of the ways in which there are so many challenges still ever present for populations because of that white settler colonialism. And this is also another example of particularly the ways in which the British um, empire um, impacted that. And so I will go ahead and stop talking, but I appreciate being able to share that with y'all. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, that was very informative. Uh, I'm sure we'll have uh, a lot of questions to follow at the end of all the presentations. Now, allow me to introduce our second panel speaker, Katle uh, Hokai Kulanyani Kisupile. Katle Hokai Kulanyani Kisupile is an international award winning cultural architecture, architect, sorry, development practitioner and interdisciplinary artist from Botswana. Her work in human rights, education, and communications. Uh, centers around decoloniality, feminism, and disability theory. Her accolades include being a TED Fellow, a Chevening Scholar, Outright UN Religion Fellow, and a Center for African Cultural Excellence, Africa Rightivist. Katleho was the 2021 nominee for the International Women of Courage Award by the US Embassy in Botswana for her work. A broadly published writer, her writings ranges from contemporary critics, policy analysis, creative work in poetry, music and theater, and scholarly research. She holds an MA in human rights, culture, and social justice from Goldsmith University of London, and a BA honors in dramatic arts from University of Witwatersrand popularly known as VET. So Katleho is a witsies. <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Katleho. Thank you very much for being here. Over to you. Thank you so much, Mpo. Thank you so very much, Mpo. And Negabatlaho Hudumidisa Hapelho Lubuchisa for the granting of your leaves to, to remain. Uh, so congratulations on that. Uh, and I would also just like to say hello. I'd like to say <laughs> Hello to uh, keep on saying hi. Uh, Jamie was there at one of the most important moments uh, in the history of Botswana regarding LGBTQIA plus people. And that was when we uh, saw the High Court hand down the ruling that uh, decriminalized consensual same sex sexual activity. Mind you, the uh, thing that I think Timothy had addressed is. And I would like to make more explicit is the fact that in some spaces, it is not so much the presence of the person that is criminalized, it is the insinuation or what is implied by what that person could do that is criminalized. So at no point was being in a same sex relationship illegal. Uh, because the state cannot tell you who you may or may not love, but the understanding that you could want to extend that love into a form of affection showing that involved uh, sexual activity, that was the criminal act. And so while you could be gay and celibate in Bozana, um, the idea was just because the kind of sex you are, you are expected to have is criminal, you then become a criminal as a person. And this is very important when we understand how we need to decolonize spaces and essentially decolonize bodies because too often we think that uh, a law, a law that 
outrules uh, homosexuality, for example, it is really not so much about uh, the people, it is about what the people are expected to do. So um, anal sex, this is a thing that I made uh, quite clear to a lot of people. And the reason I start with this is because I want to uh, move into how we can start uh, framing our own personal approaches to decolonization. So homosexuality uh, being expected then to be practiced through anal sex, uh, anal sex was criminalized. And when that decriminalization has, was handed down, I was very explicit to say to people, this is actually a sexual justice win uh, because the state has officially said it doesn't care how anybody has sex. So a married couple, a married heterosexual couple engaging in anal sex was before the 11th of July, 2019, committing a criminal act. But the expectation was they weren't criminals simply because they aren't expected to engage in such acts. And so uh, with that understanding, I want us to look at what my contribution to this panel discussion um, is going to be on decolon decolonization and decoloniality in the now. The understanding that this isn't something that we need to do in the now. So the things that have been carried over are still present and that those need to be uh, changed. When we look at the way that academia engages with um, the lived experience, I would like to highlight three particular scholars. Uh, and this is just so you can go and read their work or engage with their work after this. It's the first person who is important to you I will be discussing is Anibal Quijano. Um, who was one of and decoloniality and decolonial thought. Uh, the second one is Paulo Freire, who wrote about a book called uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And the pedagogy of the oppressed is about rethinking ways of teaching, uh, rethinking ways of education in, in ways that honor the intelligence of the people that you are working with. And uh, the third person is uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term that has been used over and over and over again over the past few uh, months, which is intersectionality. And these three concepts are very important to understanding how, when I say the statement, safety is not decolonization, that is a call, that is a provocation. Um, before I got on, I'd said to some of my friends that I'm going to go and shout at people on the internet. And to be honest, if this sounds like I'm shouting at you, uh, it is most likely because you've never thought of the concepts that I am mentioning because they have been ingrained in you. And decoloniality is about finding um, an essence where you are rescripting the points of origin. And um, so if I could just ask for my first slide, which is obnoxiously wonderfully yellow, So when we look at decoloniality, uh, and I want us to all understand this from a very uh, casual way of writing it. So this is not a uh, definition, definition. Decoloniality is rooted in disassociating development from notions founded in colonization. So notions that are founded in colonization are similar to things like civilization, uh, the idea that development must look a certain way. Um, and the other most important part of decoloniality is in that revaluing of knowledge making as well as meaning making. So the idea that because you don't know what we know, you then cannot be as intelligent or knowledgeable, you know, is meaningful to us. And uh, so when you can put me back on the screen, I'll pop back up later. And so then the this notion that safety, safety, when we achieve safety, whether it's by decriminalizing or legalizing or easing uh, criminal procedures is then supposed to be us then offering, and whoever this us is, 
offering somebody else a way of being able to not fear us without taking the blame of the fact that we are actually imposing fear upon these people is the first thing that I want us to all leave with when we look at how we look at spaces as decolonized or colonial spaces. And um, so physical safety, emotional safety, psychological safety, uh, legal safety, economic justice, but that is not decolonization. Justice in and of itself is part of the decolonial project, but you must understand that to fully decolonize is to then say, but what have we not been allowed to know? And that comes with a big process of unlearning and unlearning yourself uh, and learning things that you use to categorize and make your world more comfortable. So for example, Sichuana um, is a language that is for all intents and purposes, gender neutral. So when we have a conversation about uh, documentation that is people, the opportunity to be identified, when you look at it through the lens of Sichuana, you don't know what gender a person is, you don't know what sex a person is when you just hear the people talking about a person because we have a gender neutral um, pronoun for your own, your own gender variance within the Sasana language is possible. But from a colonial perspective or recognized, they then cannot exist. So somebody who's living through this colonial mentality of, oh no, their genders cannot exist in Botswana because you haven't spoken about them, will then be stuck in this idea that if it is not spoken about in English, the language of the colonizer, it cannot then exist. Uh, and so that is one of the first things when we look at how we decolonize the ways we start learning how to ensure that we are supportive rather than and um, imposing ourselves there discovered that people are gender are gender diverse as timothy has already stated uh, and the second point that i'd like to make is that when it, when we look at decolon decolonizing in the now we need to note that if we do not problematize uh, cultural co-opting i won't call it appropriation but cultural co-opting uh, we then become part of the problem too often we see how things that have come from spaces that are predominantly inhabited by black and brown people then get swept into the white mainstream and then those black and brown people asked to something they have culturally worked to bring to the world and something that had meaning and continues to have meaning in their spaces but has been redefined and if you do not then say well actually i know i like this but it really is not for me um then you are being a part of the problem one of the things i always use is uh, the fact that queer language the way queer people can speak to each other is not the same way that friends of queer people who are there when these queer people are talking to each other should be talking to these queer people so we will talk to each other the way we see each other and we understand it. each other we got that kinship but it is not our kin uh, so problem from the people rather than saying now that i know i'm one of you and my very last point and i think we can bring up uh, the slide again is that we must really look at how support is more a an important thing than uh, this notion of saving we cannot keep thinking that we're going to save anyone and um, so lisa if you can give me the slide one more and in this slide you should then be able to see uh the two things the, the one before so the two things where we look at decoloniality as a thought and decoloniality in a practice uh, we must be able to celebrate the lives of people 
rather than pitying their lives and thinking we need to go in and save them. Uh, because unfortunately, you get told, oh, because it's so hard for somebody else somewhere else, then you have the power and therefore use your power to save them, as opposed to to say, what am I able to do to bring out that very spirit that the folks who have been fighting on the ground, who live there every single day, are a need bringing a whole new fight and a new methodology of fighting. But it is about you supporting the fight that already exists. Uh, and with that, I wanted to say, uh, I will hand over to Albert. Thank you very much, Katiaho. We kept losing you here and there, but uh, we got the gist of everything. I hope everybody did. That was very informative as well. And thanks for sharing with us and Kaleboha. <laughs> now Katiaho and I are enjoying our, our dialect, so you'll forgive us. It's not often that we meet one of our own. <laughs> yeah, I'll move on to our next um, panelist, please. Um, uh, let me introduce uh, Alba Saborio, a non-binary uh, queer artist, act, artist from Honduras. They are currently based in Ireland, where they are the co-director co and co-founder of Gender RIP and Translate Fine Art Collective. Saborio is a visual artist who explores diverse mediums in their work as their mobility changes. Their practice currently explores film photography and national print making. Their work centers and documents the queer, disabled, migrant, and ethnic minority communities around them. Previously, they have worked both nationally in avenues such as the A4 Sounds Gallery and the RHA Gallery and internationally with this, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a French name, so forgive me if I don't say it right, but the Center Cultural, uh, Ilanderis, uh, uh, I'm sorry, once again in Paris, and the, the Rotunda in Philadelphia. Uh, Alba is also a shout out volunteer. Thank you uh, for being with us, Alba, and I will hand over to you uh, now. Thank you so much. And don't worry about the names. Um, I have no respect for most European languages, so the center is the culture ah, center cultural irlandaise is just the irish center for cultural studies in, in paris but yeah thank you so much for having me i'm like um mafo said i'm a shadow volunteer so i started volunteering with shout out maybe at this point two years ago before the pandemic happened um in my first week i did like load lo loads of, of workshops because i was having time off and it's been a really wonderful journey to be able to go to schools and have those conversations with kids, uh, particularly after having hard experiences with the marriage equality referendum. It's really refreshing to be able to have a positive impact in the younger generations that are coming up. And from the context of where I'm from, uh, I'm from Central America, uh, so it's technically the middle of Turtle Island, but Turtle Island can refer to the whole of America. Um, and the word that has been used, especially in Central America is Abiyayala um, for the whole of the American, of what we know as, not, as the American continent. So I will be using Abiyayala and Turtle Island interchangeably um, as I'm talking about the effects of colonization in the whole continent but more specifically about Central America or Abiyayala. And yeah, so really like pleased to see that everybody else has put a lot of the con historical and social context as to what I'm speaking of. And particularly about what Kat Lego was saying that decolonization is not just a thought, it's not just a theory. And particularly using the, the very famous quote that it's not a metaphor, uh, by Eve Tuck and K and Wayne Yang, that it is beyond just actually saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm thinking about decolonization and say decolonization only in an academic context. 
Um, and in particular, it's not just about how we include, say, things like two spirits or hijras or any other third genders that exist outside of the Western binary, but also actively trying to understand all of those genders that exist outside of Western gender and all of the and the histories of why. And I think that in particular, like what I'm gonna say can be a little bit inflammatory, like what Caligo mentioned, that it, if it seems like I'm attacking you, it's because you might not have heard of this, but even the actual word for queerness in itself is really a colonial term. And even all of our labels like lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender, any of them are, are colonial words because they're coming in English and they're trying to explain things that have already have always existed and trying to put them into certain boxes that's not to say that we shouldn't educate people on the existence of lgbt communities and on all of our various and wonderful identities but that we have to acknowledge that even these categories themselves are as a result of colonization in particular with transness um, we often assume that anybody who is not cisgender is trans. But in the context of colonization, like when certain native languages don't have gender at all, it's very hard to consider yourself as transgender when there's simply no gendering that has happened outside of your own culture. And then you're only being gendered by outside work, by the outside world or by the by a white Western gaze. Um, and I I'm careful to use Western as to mean imperialist because there have been em empires in the East, such as Japan, and there are also lots of native people in, in the West. But I think that is really like, that's one of the key things that I want you to think about for me anyway, is that we have to think about the usefulness of some of these terms in a post-colonial sense, how, how valuable is it to teach all of this history and teach what LGBT means without teaching the colonial context and history that is interlinked and that is in no way separable from those things. And I think one of the ways that we can try to do that is through reducing the amount that we rely on gender to navigate and create spaces, whether they are physical, virtual, spiritual, or, or physical or like residential, we really need to reduce the way that we require gender to navigate everything. Like if you try to go to the bathroom, if you try to get any health services, if you try to get any legal documents or like requirements, they all have gender involved in it. And it's really important to try to excavate that outside of that. And if we're really trying to think of decolonization as beyond of a metaphor. Um, and in particular terms say like AFAB or AMAB, which for if you don't know, can go as can mean assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth is quite a reductive way to look at bodies rather than thinking of bodies simply as existing and as existing beyond the binary. We ultimately go back to a really bioessentialist and colonial view of bodies only being assigned one gender at birth because there's an associated type of genitals with it. And this is really hard to consolidate with genitals everywhere because there is such a variance of genital expression and secondary sex characteristic expression, uh, in particular with intersex folks and also places where female genital mutilation, that mutilation is present. These are all things that we really have to consider when we're trying to think of who is assigned female at birth or, or is this a valuable term is kind of like what I'm trying to get at. But there are so many words and languages that we're trying to preserve and to continue to like keep that legacy going so that we can actively retrace back our steps kind of um, to get to the place where things went wrong, which um, some academics say it's as far back as 1492, which is when um, 
uh, Western European explorers explored and discovered America, um, which was not really discovered. It was only discovered for Europeans. It was not discovered for all the natives who actually already lived there. Um, and I think that in particular, as we're coming up with a lot of homophobia and, and really rampant transphobia in Ireland at the moment, um, we have to think about how helpful laws are going to be, such as hate crime laws, in actually getting us to further decolonize queerness or like to start the process of decolonizing queerness. Um, because I guess in Ireland, we started with the actual legal removal of, of the decriminalization of homosexuality in, in the 90s. And we have to think about if law is, sim is simply an extension of the state and the state is, an em is, is the remains of a colonial institution, why do we want more laws and how helpful we will hate crime laws be to protect and to further decolonize what we mean by queerness and by actually creating a society that is together and that is uh, allows for all of our differences and for our the things that make us unique and the things that also bring us kinship. Um, and I think that I find it really interesting hearing Kat Lego say that in Botswana, the state can't actually dictate um, who you have a relationship with because in Central America, it is literally in the constitution that a relationship is only like legitimate if it's between a man and a woman. So that is, so in order for same sex marriage, refer, marriage recognition in Central America, it would be, it would mean a change of the constitution. And that will be very difficult in the current like social and political climate. But I want us to all really remember that this decolonizing is not a metaphor. It's, it's a disruptive process. It's meant to be uncomfortable. It's meant to be disruptive. It's not meant to be nice or polite uh, because I don't think any of colonization was nice or polite at any point. Um, and I don't see why we would have to kind of not fight fire with fire, I guess, in a way. But um, I want to think that we're attempting to unsettle all of these colonial ideas that we have. And we want to try to challenge that by uphold, like challenging racial power within queerness, uh, within queer spaces, and actually acknowledging all of the history that we have and that is still present in social structures in queer spaces. So I guess something that I would like encourage everybody to do after this, especially if you're a white settled person, is to listen to the folks that are most marginalized, not to be like than you, because it's not a oppression Olympics or anything, but if you don't have a lived experience of something, seek out what people of that lived experience are saying and what can you learn from them without trying to save them. Um, and also working to decolonize the understanding of our bodies and realities is gonna help create a material reality where decolonization is actually the norm. So yeah, I guess that's me. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much once again, Alba, for being here with us. We appreciate that. And we, I'm sure everybody present will agree with me that we have learned a lot from you guys and Timothy and Katleho. Katleho, there's one, here's one for us again. Looks like we are Africanizing the, <laughs> we are Africanizing uh, today. Uh, we, we received a message from Jamie to say, Kiale Bukhatata Dizala. Thank you. So we're simply saying uh, somebody spoke to us in our language to say they're very happy they thank us. So yeah, we just had to do that. So bear with us. Uh, now I'll move on to the questions. If there are any questions from from the from everybody present. Uh, you can drop a question in the chat box, please, and then we will um any of our uh, uh, of our panel speakers can respond to that, or if it's a directly, uh, it's directed to a specific person. Thank you, but I don't seem to see any questions. Um, Paul, could I just uh, say something? Yes, please. Um, I think one of the things that is 
fundamental uh, to part of this process for us as uh, the three who've spoken as well as to a, an organization like Shout Out is to keep remembering that freedom can still be freedom if it doesn't look like yours. And that is one of the tenets of decoloniality and decolonial practice is to, to still remember that while we all seek liberation, liberation can look different from what we have thought should, it should look like. Uh, so where somebody might say the right to have access to um, gay bars is, you know, being able to register a gay bar, right, is what is a sign of freedom. For somebody else, it's simply being able to, to have a teacher that looks something like what you feel. And that being the, a part of getting to that freedom, not to say, oh, well, you know, um, because again, I grew up in Botswana where the whole notion of queerness was criminalized. Yet we have constantly had queer identifying people um, in the public space. And so that is, that is a thing that we need to, uh, to remember is that freedom can still be freedom even if it doesn't look like yours. Thank you very much, Katlako. Um, uh, will any of our panelists at this point want to, we don't seem to have a lot of questions, but there's one that was asked by Anna that says, will the transcript be available after the event as well? Yes, it will be available. Um, I would like to ask if um, Alba or Timothy, one of you would like to come back or even you Katlako. Uh, to come back and just say the last words or something. Um, I might come in with a question, Puff, that's okay, uh, just very quickly. It's fine. It's been really lovely to hear you and uh, Kathleen Ho uh, speak some of your language. And I was wondering if uh, any of the panelists could speak to the role that language plays in decolonization. I'm an Irish person who, to my shame, cannot speak any Irish. Uh, I wish I could. Um, and I feel like it's an important part of, you know, as, as Kat said, uh, you know, redefining your point of origin. And um, I would just love to hear what you all, everyone on, on the panel and Mpa, think about the role of actually speaking your language as opposed to the colonizer's language and how that relates to decolonization. Okay, thank you very much, Bella. Katlako, do you want to go first or should I? Um, I'll be brief with this. So I, I find that having grown up and being told that my intelligence meant the most in a language that I could master, and English is a beautiful language, um, and I'm happy that I get to say things like problematization, but I can't tell you what problematization is in Sifan. Um, so then the intelligence itself becomes locked with the language. The experience itself becomes locked with the language. And that's what is so important with how we treat language. I am currently working on a project where I am populating the Setswana vocabulary with brand new words or ways of speaking about sexuality, ways of talking about sexual rights, ways of talking about gender, because you might be surprised, yes, we've got a, a gender neutral language, but the practices of gendering themselves become the thing we fight, because you've got these practices that you need to then educate people using language they can work with to say, this is actually what toxic masculinity means. Um, and you might have made it part of Sitwana culture, but it actually isn't Sitwana culture. It's a hangover of colonial uh, impressions. So I am making new language in Sitwana that is brand new today. And somebody might say, but what gives me the right to create this language? And the thing that I always say to people is languages are made they don't come down from heaven. Um, they are made, they, they survive because of what people choose to keep. So have the audacity to keep finding and building language so that you can know how to, to find yourself 
you can name a pain once you know how to find the word for it. Wow, that was amazing. Now I don't know what to say <laughs> after that. <laughs> anyway. You uh, might like, I, okay, yes, you can go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think it's really interesting. Uh, it's a really interesting question, Bella. And I think like for me, it's really hard because Spanish is my first language, but it's still my colonizer language. So I'm still part of that colonizer there because that similar to what Catalejo says that the knowledge is, is locked in that language. And it's really hard to separate what, like to, to speak even about myself in Spanish in terms that it is accurate. Um, and in particular now in Spanish, because every absolutely everything is gendered, like uh, inanimate objects are gendered um, at random. It's not very, there's no rules or anything. So it's now we've entered, or we're trying to introduce a gender neutral pronoun as uh, so we would have el for him, ella for her, and then ella for they, them, basically. Um, and then we've come up with, you know, Latinx or Latine for gender neutral options of Latin as a geographical term. And it's been quite interesting to see the Royal Academy of Spanish come out and say that they don't recognize none of those words as real in the Spanish language. Or, and even the word queer is not actually recognized as a real word in Spanish language. Um, and that they won't, that they have no desire to make the language gender neutral and all this kind of stuff. And it's kind of like, okay, thanks. Like, we have to keep making these words anyway, and we have to keep doing these things because we exist, even if the Royal Academy of Spanish says that we don't, or that those words are not legitimate, we actually exist. And that also like almost in a way precludes the language itself. Um, so we're creating for the things that are already existing. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Uh, just briefly um, to respond to Bella's question as well. Uh, like I said, I'm from this small, very small country with about uh, 2 million plus people. Uh, we are still one of the few monarchies in the world. We are holding on so tightly to our culture. So that's one of the things that maybe we can pride ourselves in as the Basotho nation. It's true that we, colonialism has left its traces amongst us and a lot of our ways have kind of been influenced. But I think people are with the decolonization of the education system and all other sectors, we are coming, it's like there's a rebirth in terms of finding ourselves again, wearing our traditional attires without labeling them as, you know, with us, a woman is supposed to celebrate her body and show it off. Then colonialism came with this formal clothing and hiding. And if now a Mosut woman goes out wearing, you know, one of our traditional attires, it's like, oh, she's naked, but it's not nakedness. That's how we are. So in terms of saying, as much as we have been colonized and there's a lot of colonial uh, traces in our system, our language is very much preserved. So even the state of the nation address dance in our language. So if you are with us, you have to learn our language for anyone to really survive. But English is another medium of instruction though, because in schools, it's still there, but in schools, so our language is there. So that's one good thing that we still have. But like Katleho was also saying, uh, um, and Alba that, most of our languages uh, are kind of gender neutral. So you wouldn't really tell whether they're talking about men, female, whatever, because the, 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 even the names in most cases, like my name, Katako's name, it, it, it's a unisex name. So there could be a impor male or whatever. So that's one thing about it. So it makes it a bit challenging to address certain issues because of that, but I hope this, uh, answers your question. Yeah, and just kind of like another perspective that I think sort of ties um, sort of this conversation about like the creation of language. Um, so, you know, I am, I am a white panelist um, and that is my lived experience. Um, and, you know, the language that I speak is the language of a colonizer. 
Um, and I recently actually was fortunate enough to be able to do like some genealogy, which again, like many people of color, particularly on the North American continent, aren't able to do because of white colonial 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 settler, um, settlerism. But um, you know, in terms of like the two spirit community. Um, you know, this is a word that was created in the early 90s. Um, you know, it's only about 30 years old, a little less than that. Um, and, you know, this term was created by queer and trans indigenous folks specifically to have sort of a, an umbrella term and a unifying piece of language that can describe that particular experience, that particular lived experience. But, you know, historically, a number of those identities, um, like I said in my present part of the presentation, have been. Um, very much historically documented and very much existed in a variety of sovereign indigenous nations and cultures across this continent. But, you know, when we see sort of that settler colonialism come forth, uh, a lot of those identities were purposefully erased as much as possible. And so, you know, we have lost information about some of them, including sort of what, um, what the word even was, right? Um, and then kind of on the more damaging front too, well, not mostly more damaging, but on a similar front, um, you know, some of these identities um, were specifically misnamed, misnamed by um, settler colonists. And so, you know, there are some words that, you know, appear in historical records that are actually in effect slurs um, to, to, to queer and trans indigenous folks because it specifically is white, cis, straight folks um, misremembering and purposely misnaming those identities to further devalue them. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's just like sort of a perspective of thinking about like the ways in which like this language develops and how it's valid and sort of the historical reasons for why it needs to develop in a variety of different contexts. Thank you very much. At, at this juncture, I would like to thank um, everybody present, especially shout out for organizing this event, Lisa, Bella, and the rest of your team. Thank you so much. This has been a great initiative and I'm sure we've all learned something from it. And I'm very happy to have spoken my language uh, after a long time. So yeah, I'm particularly very happy uh, Timothy and Alba, thank you also for taking part. Uh, uh, I would like uh, now to pass uh, back to our host for closing up. Thank you so much for having me as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Mpa, for taking us through this evening. And thank you so much to all of our amazing speakers for joining us tonight, it really is. Uh, a privilege and an honor to have had you with us. Uh, we're really, really grateful for your words tonight. Um, and we hope as well that if you attended this evening, that you might follow the speakers on social media uh, to keep up with the work that they are doing and the work that they will be doing in the future. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Paul, for moderating and for guiding us through the discussion. Uh, we will be making arrangements to share the recording and the transcript transcript after the talk so do just bear with us and if you know anyone who was unable to make it tonight we'll try and make it available to them as well we also want to really thank our sponsors the fulbright commission for their support in making this event happen and we'd like to say hello to the fulbright representatives who are here tonight and again just to really thank you for making this unique and kind of a uh, very special event uh, take place this evening and for supporting our work this event is free, but we would encourage you if you have a few quid spare, if you have some money to hand uh, to make a donation to Massey, M-A-S-I, it's www.massey.ie. Uh, definitely to support their work as a voice for migrants and asylum seekers in Ireland and to help further the fight to end direct provision. And I'm sure as well that our speakers might have some causes close to their hearts who they might like to share. And we can include those in the kind of post event email as well, if you would like to learn more about the work they do and the causes that are close to our speakers hearts this evening. But again, thank you so much for joining us at this event. If you're new to shout out, we hope that you'll follow us online uh, on our own socials to keep up with our work. And we hope that you enjoyed this event and we hope that you took as much from it as I know we all did. Thank you. Thanks so much to Shada for organizing this. So thanks to you too.
Yeah, thank you all so much. Keep well, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Khusyane. Kihan kakatakho.